Hello AP Stat. Today we're going to take a look at binomial distributions, geometric distributions, and sampling distributions. Uh, definitely another chapter that uh, I know we could use a, a good bit of review on because um, you know it's it's been a while since we dealt with this stuff, and um, yeah, it's easy to forget some of these things. Even though a lot of what we've been doing this second semester, all the inference and stuff is is based on sampling distributions. Um, so uh, it, it's still easy to forget a lot of these these details. So let's jump right in. <clears throat> so uh, binomial setting. So binomial, we're dealing with two possible outcomes. So that's the, the binomial part. Um, and so uh, two possible outcomes is one of the features. Another feature here is that we have a fixed number of trials. Uh, that separates it from the geometric. So that's we have a set number of trials, and we're gonna we're try something a certain number of times. We're gonna, you know, flip a coin ten times, or take ten free throws, or or what have you. Uh, the probability of success is the same for each trial. So a coin, we know that's that's true. Free throws, we sometimes assume that uh, whether or not that's true or not. Um, I don't know, but uh, there have been some studies about that. But uh, we treat those as independent, which, um, yeah, this is kind of interesting. They also say, oh, trials have to be independent. So, yeah, that's true. The, the, the constant probability implies that they would be independent if the probability stays the same. Like, obviously, there's no change. Then, obviously, it's independent. Um, but it, it's not the reverse. If they're independent, that doesn't necessarily imply um, constant probability. So, like, if you're doing different things, right, they might be independent, like a coin flip and rolling a die. Uh, those two in probabilities are independent, but they're not the same probability, so they have to be the same, which implies that. Uh, and so you end up with a binomial random variable where x is the number of successes that you get out of those tries. And the binomial distribution is the distribution of those successes, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to n, um, uh, actually 0 zero successes as well so zero through n um, and then you have the probabilities associated with each of those that's the entire binomial distribution um, the random variable is just x we use that capital letter to, to represent that um, and that is the number of successes uh, symbolically we can represent that with this shorthand notation you don't have to do that but um, where you do capital B and then in parentheses N and P, the number of trials of probable success. Those are the two important parameters to define. Um, and so we can calculate this probability with the formula, but we, we do have binome PDF uh, and CDF. I'll, I'll get, get to that in a second, but they do this a little differently. I, I wrote it over here, So, um, but it's the number of trials, probability success, and number of successes. Um, and so you don't have to know this. This is on your formula sheet. So um, let's see, where are we? This binomial probability is on your formula sheet, um, but you don't have to use that most of the time. Um, you might need to identify it, uh, but you, and the other thing is you don't necessarily have to understand the, the first piece of it. That's the binomial coefficient. That's a that's a combination, actually, a NCR or whatever. Um, so this is the formula for that. You can get into that, but you, you really don't have to know that bit. Um, that's just uh, you know, so you know how that formula works. Uh, the truth is, you might have to identify that. You know, actually, that's not true. A, a, uh, uh, multiple choice, you might have to identify that. I would be very surprised if that showed up on free response. A lot of times, if they ask you to do it, you can show the formula, or you can write out um, in words that it's a binomial distribution. You have to define it, or you can actually do that that binome command. So here, they're showing it calculation, but you could do that binome PDF this way. Now, if you're going to get work on free response. You do want to label those, so that's the number of trials, uh, the probability of success, and then x value is how what it calls it in the calculator, but it really is the number of successes. Um, and so that's under second distribution. That's where binome and geometric both are, um, among other things, normal as well. So um, this is, yeah, uh, for especially for free response. The expectation is... Um, you have to identify the distribution so that it's binomial or geometric later on by name or formula. So you can do the formula if you want, but you don't have to. You can just name it and then define the parameters. You have to say what n are and p are. So you have to, if you get all that information out there, which if you write that out and the, you know the, that binome statement, they're they're counting that as defining it and then the parameters. Um, and then that's that's all you need to do. And then you can go straight from you know a probability to an answer, and you don't have to actually. Uh, show that formula um, so find understand it you know take a look at it try and remember it but you don't have to and then cdf does the cumulative distribution um, and so it does up to less than or equal to five 
Um, and so then when you do that, uh, that, that last argument becomes your upper bound. And so this here, less than or equal to five, you would do binom CDF, and then 10 was the trials, and it's 0.65 probably success, and uh, up to, I wrote the wrong number there. This, sh I wrote three because they stopped at three, but it should be less than or equal to five, so there should be two more. Go oh, there they are. All right, so yeah, that should be a five. Um, but yeah, that is binom CDF, and it would just add up zero plus probability of one plus probability of two all the way up to whatever number you type if you want to do greater than you do one minus that so uh, be very careful about what you want to subtract away if you want more than five you would subtract away cdf5 if you want at least five you would actually subtract away cdf4 um, but that's some binomial probabilities we do have the mean and standard deviation of a binomial distribution if those would come up um, those formulas should kind of look familiar we actually base our prop proportions on those formulas and those are on your formula sheet as well so you can keep that um, handy um, uh, so there's the mean and the standard deviation and then the shape is binomial but it can become approximately normal this isn't a big thing to get but it's actually what we learned later is, later is based on this that if the binomial distribution is, is the appropriate one, the shape actually gets closer and closer to normal the larger that sample size gets. So if n and p uh, and n times 1 minus p are both at least 10, um, then the shape of that binomial distribution is approximately normal. If this first condition is not met, we end up being a little skewed right. The, the second condition, we end up being usually skewed left. Um, so, um, But yeah, we can meet that condition of being approximately normal. Um, so that really we need it later for proportions when we do our uh, our assumption with proportions that it's based on this and so we end up with a normal distribution um, so then into geometric distributions geometric a lot of the same features as the binomial they compare them uh, we have two possible outcomes uh, the probability of success is the same for each trial and the trials are independent and again that's implied um, so that that bit is the same what's different now is there's not a fixed number of trials uh, we're interested in the number of trials necessary to ob obtain our first success. So we're just looking for that one success. We're going to fail, 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 succeed, then we're done. That, that however many tries it took, that's the what that geometric random variable's output would be. And then, then that geometric distribution would be each outcome and the probabilities. Now the number of outcomes here can go, so the binomial distribution, as I said before, goes from zero to the n. So if you have 10 trials, you can have anywhere from zero to 10 successes. Uh, geometric distribution, it starts at one. You can't succeed without at least one try. And then it goes on until infinity because you might never succeed. Um, so it goes on and on and on. And distribution kind of ends up looking like that um, generally. Um, Here's our formula, uh, and so this is on your formula sheet as well. Um, but what it is, and they, they actually, I guess, write it, yeah, I, um, they write it in a different order here. So the P is after the, the failure, so failures and then success. Here they write it a little differently, but they have basically you have one success and then a whole bunch of failures. All right, if you're going to succeed on your 10th try, you're going to fail nine times, so one minus P is your probability of failure. Um, so you have nine of those and then one success. And that's a pretty easy one to actually do by hand, but Geomet PDF will do it for you. Um, and it's a little different. You actually have P first and then N, um, which you know P is actually the only parameter that you need to define it. And then N is kind of like what X was. It's the number of trials. Um, and so that's Geomet PDF and you've got Geomet CDF as well, which will do cumulative up to that point. Um, so you can take a look at those uh, examples. And then we've got sampling distributions in this chapter. So this stuff was, was you know, pretty old. Sampling distributions actually should hopefully be more in your mind from, um, that's basically what we're dealing with when we're dealing with inference, where we're constantly talking about sampling distributions and a lot of our inference is based on this, this is kind of the foundation of that. So uh, the idea is that uh, a statistic is any value that describes a sample. Uh, so we, we focused on the mean, the proportion, standard, sample standard deviation, um, things like that, uh, means and proportions uh, most often. The sampling distribution is the distribution of that statistic for all possible samples of a given size. So if you chose sample size 10 or something like that, and you picked Every, literally every possible sample of size 10 you could from that population, which isn't you know always going to be a very large number, um, and then you plotted all of that particular statistic. So from every sample of 10, you took the sample mean and then put a dot on your graph or, or you know put it into your to your data, and then you took another sample of 10 and got a sample mean, and then another sample of 10, and you did that until you did them all. 
that distribution you get would be the sampling distribution. You're not always going to get the exact same X bar. You're going to get X bars a little high, a little low. Uh, they're going to be distributed. So um, yeah, uh, and then so that's it's only technically the sampling distribution is if you do them all. If you just do a simulation of it, it's not actually the entire sampling distribution. If you just do a few of them and, and graph them, sometimes we do that and we show, oh, we did 100 samples and here's what it looks like. That's a simulated sampling distribution. It's not the actual sampling distribution. Um, and so but they say if you, if you just do a few samples drawn, it's not a distribution. It's not a sampling distribution. It actually is a distribution. Uh, it's not a sampling distribution. So um, that's I was, was kind of being picky about that. And I think they kind of had that typo, that, that word missing. Um, so um, <clears throat> for means, if we're dealing with X bars from a population with mean mu and population sigma, uh, standard deviation sigma, then these are our formulas. And so those are on our formula sheet on uh, the back. So um, here's for me, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. No, yeah, that's right. Means, so means is down here on the back. So we have our mean and our standard deviation. Uh, formulas there. Um, so the average X bar will equal the population mean. If it's unbiased, the standard deviation will be sigma over root n. So the bigger sample size we get, the less variability we expect in our X bars. Right? If we get samples of size 100, they're going to be pretty close to each other. There's not going to be much variability to those samples, where if we get samples of size 10, uh, they're going to be more widely variable. Um, so that is uh, the center and the spread. Um, and that, and those have a couple of rules. So this really, this first rule, they don't mention this much, but it's if it's unbiased, if we get an unbiased sample, then the, the mean of our X bar should match the population mean. And then if our if our samples are independent, now technically we they're not independent since we are generally sampling without replacement. That that mean changes as we take an individual away. Um, you know, things are actually changing where we're less likely to get certain certain values. Um, it's pretty much negligible, though. As long as the population is at least 10 times the sample size, which is, you know, almost always the case, we're good. Um, and so that's the independence condition. Well, these are, we're kind of getting into those conditions we're checked for, for inference. Uh, this stuff you don't need to know. Uh, you're welcome to take a look at it. It's kind of interesting. It's not that complex of a formula, and you can think about why it works, but I'm not going to really get into it. That's the finite population correction. If they're not in independent, if the population is not 10 times the sample size, all you do is multiply by this fraction here, or this, uh, that finite population correction, and you're good to go. So. Don't need to worry about that though. Uh, so let's get on to shape. We got our center, our spread, and then our shape is going to be, well, the central limit theorem often comes into play. Uh, the shape of the sampling distribution will depend on both the shape of uh, the popula original population and the sample size. So uh, if the original population is approximately normal, then we're good. The sampling distribution is approximately normal. If the original population is not normal, uh, or unknown, then the sample si and the sample size is small, then the shape of the sampling distribution will be similar to that of the original population. So uh, what we'd like to have happen in, that, in this case with an unknown population is that we have a large sample size. In that case, we get to use central limit theorem. If we have a large sample, uh, then the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. Uh, and so the sample size is at least 30 is kind of a common rule that we use for that, but the larger the better. Um, in this case, when we're actually checking conditions, uh, we actually used, we, we would look at the graph and we kind of make an assumption about the population based on it. So I kind of summarized that here. This is a good table to, to make sure you understand. And, and you know, you just got that on this formula sheet, but maybe you want to bookmark this, some, um, uh, some features of it. So here's our population distribution mean standard deviation. If the shape is normal, then we're good. The sampling distribution will be normal. If not, then we have central limit theorem. Here are our formulas. And so this condition, this this is if it's unbiased, uh, that's our random condition. This is if they're independent, the population is 10 times the sample size. And then if it's small, we actually looked at a graph, we would actually plot our sample data and we'd say, oh, well, it looks fairly symmetric, no outliers. So we'll, we'll go with it. We kind of did that for checking our our inference conditions, and then central limit theorem if the sample size was large and we got approximately normal distribution. Um, so that is sampling distribution for the sample mean. Um, and so the sampling distribution for means. And this is for one population. We'll get to the two stuff later on. Um, so then we're going to move to proportions, which is up here. This is on the back of our formula sheet. Uh, and so there's some examples there, but uh, proportions, a proportion, a sample proportion is in your sample, the number of successes out of the number of trials or the number and, you know, the size of our sample. Uh, and um, 
we use p hat to represent the sample sample proportion. The true population proportion is p. That's the population proportion of everybody. So if um, we have you know some proportion of people that would vote for a particular issue in the population, well, if we go out and get a sample, that our number, our observed proportion won't necessarily match that exactly, right? We have variability to our sample proportion. We might get a sample that happens to be a little higher, a little proportion a little higher, a little lower. But on average, that sample proportion, so actually this is the binomial distribution. Um, they're kind of relating it to that. Uh, if we just divide that by n, we get a proportion. Um, so this is the number of successes. We divide that by n, we get a proportion of successes. Uh, and so these are that's where these formulas basically come from, right? Those formulas on this formula sheet. So on average, our sample proportion should match our population proportion. Uh, and then the standard deviation of those proportions is there. And of course, that n in the denominator means we, um, the bigger the sample we get, the less variability we expect. Uh, from sample to sample. Uh, so there's our center and our spread. Our shape is approximately normal, and that fits that kind of why that binomial distribution comes and becomes normal. So it's approximately normal. If this says if n and p are large enough, actually we don't want p to be large for the normality condition. We actually want p to be as close to 0.5 as, as possible. If p is really large, that means n has to be even larger. So the real the real condition is not this. It's if n times p and n times 1 minus p is at least 10, right? If, if p is really large, that's actually bad for this condition. Uh, we end up being more like, you know, harder to, to do that. And so we need a bigger sample size. Uh, so it's really about the sample size being large. Um, so really not that p there. Uh, but if those conditions are met, then we end up with an approximately normal. It's technically discrete. You have a fixed number of trials and you have number of successes. That's discrete. Um, but it, it the number of bars, if there's enough bars, uh, it, the shape becomes approximately normal, which is that continuous distribution. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, that's it. So then you can do normal calculations based on once you have that normal shape, uh, you can do normal CDF and calculate probabilities. And really this was just the foundation for inference, which will be the next chapter. We'll get back and get into inference, which is, you know, kind of the, the meat of AP statistics. And the last thing I highlighted here was that Harold should have studied. Yeah, he should have studied. Uh, just like you should study. Uh, this was something about how he's guessing on every question and it's basically impossible that he'll even get like above a 30 percent so um take a look at those take a look at the rapid review answer some questions based on that ultimately um binomial and geometric got a few practice problems a lot of times those are those ones that are mixed in with other problems uh on the ap test um and i imagine that's what it would be this year right it'll just be kind of a part like oh now we're part c do this binomial calculation based on some probability you calculated uh in part b um, and recall that if that happens and you don't know how to do part B, just make it up, make up a reasonable proportion and, um, and go with it and use that in your binomial calculation. If, if you can do the binomial without, you know, being able to do a part that precedes it. So, uh, let me know any questions you have. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're staying healthy and happy. I'll talk to you soon.